So let's get to some of the clinical examples. I want to give you some in-depth uh, 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 information on how we apply this uh, with patients we've actually seen in our practice. Uh, so uh, this first case I want to discuss with you on to show the rapid clinical effects of nutrition. You know, again, we oftentimes talk about, you know, the, the long-term benefits of nutrition. That's really important because, you know, we want to say, okay, you know, if you follow this lifestyle, you have better longevity and you also have better quality of life over time. That's really important. However, in my situation, you know, what about the patient who's acutely ill? What about the patient who's in the CCU, the ICU, who's in the hospital? Does this apply in this situation? And the answer is yes. And I'm going to share with you how, in this first case, is going to show uh, how this happens. Because if I give someone broccoli today, generally people think maybe in about 10 years, something good might happen. But if I give someone, you know, a raw detox today, what's going to happen in the next few days or the next few weeks? Here's a 65-year-old man with known coronary disease. He had multiple prior myocardial infarctions or heart attacks. He went to the emergency room with chest pain. And uh, he was known to have an ejection fraction of 35 to 40%. Uh, and so uh, they did troponin levels. He uh, was ruled out uh, for a heart attack at that time. So an emergency room will send you out uh, based on that. Uh, his symptoms of chest pain and shortness of breath uh, and mild exertion persisted. We saw him in the office a few days later. Uh, and of course, you know, he had coronary disease, ischemic heart disease, and angina. Uh, and the clinical intervention that we took is we looked at his medications, made adjustments in his medications, and we applied a nutritional intervention immediately. We started on a nutritional detox. So I'm going to share with you uh, troponin levels. Now, when you go to the emergency room, they measure troponin levels at nanograms per ml. We measured a much uh, more sensitive uh, level of picograms per ml. Uh, and on the first day that we saw this patient, he had a troponin level of 28 picograms per ml. At this level, you want to get your troponin levels below 10. Uh, his is far above 10. <clears throat> and so we can see here within one week of the nutritional detox, the troponin level drops pretty significantly. It bumped up to 14 as we continue to wean his medication. I really think that by taking him off glipizide, he's a diabetic, uh, it dropped more. Um, and this medication and, and animal model has been shown to cause ischemia. So if you look at the graphical display of this, in the first week, we had a rapid drop in troponin level. <clears throat> what this demonstrates is that the myocardial stress that he was uh, suffering from rapidly decreased uh, by more than half, from state level by more than half, even though because we made an adjustment in his uh, uh, medication that caused even more of a drop. But this shows the rapid effects of nutritional detox using one uh, biomarker. And we, we know that with other biomarkers as well as I'll show you later. But I want to show you this example because by simply using a detox regimen, we had an immediate early effect, an improvement in this overall uh, clinical improvement shown by reduction in myocardial stress, reduction in these troponin levels. So his chest pain also uh, was reduced rapidly. His symptoms of shortness of breath improved. Uh, and his energy level improved all within the first week and persisted throughout that period of detox. So not only do you have a biomarker indication showing at the biochemistry chemical level that this patient is improving rapidly, but also symptomatically this patient improving rapid, rapidly and all at the same time of us reducing his medication. So I, I gave you this illustration to show that, you know, uh, by certain biomarkers, we know the patient's condition improved rapidly. We've had similar type of findings with Patients with chronic lung disease, where we monitor the oxygen saturations at rest or with ambulation, and we measure those weekly, and we see those things improve as well. Um, now, uh, case two is an uh, acutely ill 60-year-old man uh, that we saw in the office. And so this is the gentleman that uh, came to office, and actually his physician called me personally and says, you know, can you see this patient? He's, you know, really ill, and we got him in the office the same day. Uh, uh, upon evaluation, uh, he had a very, uh, very elevated blood pressure, reported blood pressure in the 180s over 100s at home. He was 170 over 111 on office, heart rate 122. Uh, he was uh, morbidly obese, uh, and um, he reported having uh, blood sugar levels in the 200s. So basically a diabetic with hypertension, he had uh, lots of uh, swelling, uh, and um, 
uh, of those lower extremities. And so this was a gentleman that we consider to be acutely ill, he had a chronic illness that, with an acute exacerbation. Uh, and, and we really felt that he would benefit from being admitted to the hospital. We did a 12 lead uh, EKG. And he was under abnormal heart rhythm called atrial, fibril atrial flutter, excuse me. Uh, and so that explained his heart rate of 122. Here's the EKG. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with reading EKGs, you see a typical, counter typical counterclockwise flutter with the sawtooth pattern and two, three, and AVF. Uh, and so this gentleman really needed to be uh, placed in a more acute setting. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of give you an overview of our approach with him in the hospital and then go through some of the labs. So essentially what we did, we admitted him to the hospital. Um, we gave him medication to control his heart rate. But again, I put him on a raw detox diet. Uh, he had food from our nutrition center. Uh, so we started the detox at the same time of starting the acute care management for this patient in the hospital. And so uh, we also eventually cardioverted him to normal sinus rhythm. Now, we start off with blood work. His kidney function is abnormal. The creatinine is about three and a quarter. Uh, and over time, now I apologize, these are not time units, but this is over the course of weeks. I'll give you that from 0.1 to 0.21. Uh, but the important part is just to give you an overall trend as to how his kidney function improved. A lot of this adverse kidney function is probably decreased perfusion of the kidneys by the heart. So if someone comes in, their kidneys, looks like their kidneys are not working well. A lot of that's due to low cardiac output, the kidneys not being perfused well. And so the kidney function appears abnormal, but some of this is intrinsic kidney uh, disease. And some of this is what we call pre-renal azotemia due to uh, abnormal cardiac output, abnormal uh, uh, coronary flow. Uh, GFR, that stands for glomerular filtration rate, for those of you who are not medical people, and that's the rate at which your kidneys are filtering. So it, it inversely coordinates with the creatinine. So the more rapidly your body filtrates the kidney, uh, filtrates the blood rather, the more the less creatinine is hanging around. So creatinine is a protein that we measure uh, that to determine a filtration of the blood. So the kidney filtration rate was around a little over 20 and it went up to uh, nearly 60. Now, greater than 60 is not, ideally is greater than 90, but greater than 60 is considered uh, normal for many older patients. Uh, if your GFR is persistently 15 or less, that's typically when the, the kidney specialists declare you as end stage and recommend dialysis for you. Uh, so this individual was very close to that when he came in, but a lot of this is due to his poor circulation. So. We did medical management, we controlled his heart rate and rhythm. We also put him on a nutritional detox in the hospital. So this is what I really wanna point out to you. So this individual, when we saw him in the office, his albumin level was 1.7. Uh, now he was on the standard American diet. He was eating lots of animal protein and the like. Uh, and he probably did not eat a lot of fruits and vegetables, I recall from his, his intake. Uh, he did eat some, but not a lot. Most of it was already processed. Uh, he owned a barbecue uh, company in uh, the Houston area. So anyway, this gentleman was eating animal protein. So we put him on raw fruits and vegetables only uh, in the hospital. So within, this is about a week's time. And uh, in this period of time, his albumin level went from about 1.7 to about three, normal is four. Uh, so it went up normal. This is raw fruits and vegetables only. He was not even eating beans. So he's eating kale, spinach, uh, drinking smoothies, uh, cold-pressed juices, uh, many of these foods from our, our, our nutrition regimen, sprouts, uh, nori wraps, uh, all these from our nutrition center, and his albumin level went up. Now, after leaving the hospital, he went home. Uh, we were seeing him in the office, but he did get off his diet. He ate some oyster soup and some gumbo, both having lots of animal protein, and guess what? Albumin level drops. He also felt sick. His swelling came back during this phase. The swelling went down. Kidney function improved, as you saw from before. But here, when he went back on animal protein, the albumin dropped, kidney function dropped. He got worse. We put him back on a smoothie feast. He was on food level zero. In a relatively short period of time, his albumin level went up. Again, animal protein, it goes down uh, on plant foods, raw plant foods, not even with beans the animal protein, the albumin goes up. So what is the explanation here? It's pretty simple. Many individuals that we see, especially in an acute setting, uh, they have low albumin, 
There are two primary reasons that I see patients with low albumin. One, <clears throat> they have poor liver function. I see some of the liver with low albumin, they probably have hepatic dysfunction. I'll talk about that in a minute. Individuals who have an acute inflammatory condition uh, often leak albumin. And so if they have a flare up of chronic congest uh, chronic obstructive lung disease or a lupus flare or rheumatoid arthritis flare, these acute inflammatory conditions result in albumin's leaking, albumin molecules leaking in the capillaries. And so the albumin will drop. Anybody with acute infections with cytokine storms will have a rapid drop in the albumin level. So what we saw here, this individual is in an acute inflammatory uh, condition. Uh, his inflammation was systemic. That's why I had edema, but also the albumin was dropping. So that re resulted in a decreased oncotic pressure, which results in more swelling. But when we detoxed him, the inflammation was turned off. The fire was put, off, put out. When the fire is put out, the albumin recovers. When he consumes a bad meal or two, it only takes one bad meal or a bite of bad food, trigger that inflammation, everything starts to leak and the albumin goes down. Then when he recovers, inflammation is stopped, the albumin comes back up. So this is clearly a situation where inflammation results in a drop of albumin. And many people say, well, you're on a plant-based diet, where do you get your protein? Well, you get your protein from the liver, but it's not only maintaining, uh, 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 creating protein or building protein from the amino acids that you consume, but it's also maintaining a protein. So protein can leak. And when you consume these inflammatory triggering foods, it actually causes a reduction of protein. And this clinic example shows that uh, uh, explicitly. So in essence, uh, we had a greater than 50% medication reduction, uh, correction and control of heart rate and rhythm, uh, reduced his uh, leg edema, improvement his albumin, and improved his overall clinical well-being. And when he got off the diet and then got back on, that really demonstrated to him the importance of complying with the nutritional regimen. So sometimes non-compliance can work in your favor, uh, even though it's not the, the ideal outcome that you're looking for. Um, the next case I want to discuss with you is uh, uh, case three. And this is the individual who presented to us. He had flown in from the East Coast. Uh, this individual had congestive heart failure, type 2 diabetes, had hyperlipidemia, uh, his shortness of breath, and his ejection fraction he thought was in the 20s or 30s. Uh, but this individual, uh, this was during the, the COVID pandemic, and he had flown down. He had not seen a physician in about eight months at the time he saw us. Uh, so uh, as alluded to in the, the title, uh, clinical history, heart failure, he had a single chamber and a defibrillator implanted. Uh, he had type 2 diabetes, he had a history of a stroke, hyperlipidemia, uh, had a strong family history of uh, congestive heart failure and some, failure and some uh, family members had transplants. Uh, and his main symptom was substernal chest tightness that occurred at rest, but also with uh, short level exertion. Uh, he also had, you know, uh, shortness of breath. And um, uh, again, he wasn't uh, sure about his ejection fracture. He thought it was told it was very, very low. And in fact, his doctors uh, recommended that he should get an LVAD and be placed on a transplant list. Um, because he didn't get this uh, proper explanation as to the why and the details, he really refused to put this off and, and wanted to do something different. And so he found us and, and came to see us. Um, when we saw him on evaluation, his blood pressure was 96 over 48, heart rate 78, and his weight was 230 pounds. Now, he was on 13 medications. Now, I won't go through the details of all the medication, but he was on allopurinol for gout. Uh, he was taking magnesium. The carvedilol is a beta blocker. It's typically used to treat heart failure patients. It slows the heart down, rel relaxes the heart, decreases stress on the heart. Trigenta is for, uh, di for uh, diabetes. Eliquis is uh, 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 a blood thinner. Uh, uh, and so it's used. He may have been found to have atrial fibrillation uh, early on. Uh, he didn't give us this history, but you know we ascertained that, uh, deduced that based on the medication list. Uh, he was on Entresto, which is a heart failure medicine. Now, torsamide is a diuretic, uh, and this diuretic, uh, this dose is very, very high. Typically, this medicine is used once a day, typically 20 milligrams, 40 milligrams once a day. He was on 60 milligrams twice a day. He had been on this for about eight months. No one had followed his labs or anything. So I was a little bit worried about this, especially given his blood pressure. Uh, he was also on a Torvastatin for hyperlipidemia. Um, 
uh, and again, insulin for his uh, diabetes, vitamin D and potassium, of course, being on such a high dose of diuretic. So this gentleman flew in, we're seeing him for the office, in the office for the first time, we draw his blood, and we start to detox. Now we make some modest changes in medication. We reduce the diuretic uh, and I didn't want him, I didn't know where he was baseline. So I just cut this in half uh, and reduced some of the medications because his blood pressure was low. Uh, and then we uh, arranged to see him uh, one day, no, two days, two or three days later. Now uh, we got the blood test results and what we noticed is glucose is a little bit high, but the creatinine was 5.08. He did not know. He didn't tell us he had diagnosed a kidney failure, uh, and he didn't know that. His GFR was 14, but remember before I said a GFR, 15 or less puts you at end-stage renal failure. And so here he is presenting to us labs for the first time. He's at end-stage renal failure. Uh, and uh, my thinking is a lot of this is dehydration. How much? I don't know. I'm seeing this patient for the first time. Uh, cholesterol was okay. He's on, you know, pretty hefty dose of atorvastatin. And of course, he has insulin resistance with a known history of diabetes. So uh, what we did, of course, on day one, put him on food level zero to four B. Uh, but then after a week, uh, after the second time, we put on food level zero to intensify his detox based on those initial lab findings. We continued to wean his diuretics and other medication. And we initially gave him intravenous IV hydration. So we gave him a liter of fluid the very first day, we, uh, the, excuse me, the second day we saw him because I thought that creatinine elevation was due to pre-renal azotemia, pre azotemia and a lot of dehydration given the high dose of diuretic. So we stopped the diuretics and then we put him on uh, IV fluids. And uh, typically most doctors are afraid to give heart failure patients IV fluids. We're not, we're aggressive with it. We monitor O2 SATs, we monitor their clinical condition, but oftentimes patients with congestive heart failure or low EF can be intravascularly volume depleted. And I think that was the case with this patient and that's gonna be elucidated as I go on. So we gave him a liter of fluid on day two that we saw him, which is about three days after the initial visit. Then we saw him the next day in the office and we saw that his creatinine was even worse. So we decided to put him in the hospital to be more aggressive with the IV infusion uh, to see how he does. So during the time of our initial, uh, the first two office visits and the hospitalization, these were the medication changes that we had made. We had stopped the allopurinol, stopped the covetolol, trigenta, all of his diuretic medications, and insulin was stopped. Uh, and he was on, put on an insulin sliding scale in the hospital. Uh, he was only left on the vitamin D. Uh, we replaced the carvedilol with the biostolic, which is another type of beta blocker. It does drop the blood pressure as fast. Kept him on the vitamin D. He was started on CoQ10 um, uh, supplement. There was a, an algae that we use, uh, uh, E3 Live. We started him on CMOS. And he was given a lighter drum patch to treat his arthritis, uh, which he had uh, ongoing knee pain. So we were able to reduce his medication list by, by half, essentially, uh, and to improve his overall um, well-being. So here's how his clinical course was kidney function. The creatinine started at 5.8, the first one, and it was at 12.8. And that was probably the detox combined with the diuretics. So we placed him in the hospital and aggressively di uh, hydrated him rather, removed the diuretics, and his creatinine came down precipitously here. And, and, and it corresponded to a GFR, which started, this red line shows the dialysis line. This is end-stage renal failure right here. And we showed how this actually came up and improved and almost, I say almost, but got fairly close to normal uh, renal perfusion. Now, granted, he likely has some intrinsic kidney disease, but a lot of what we saw was uh, pre-renal or low perfusion of the kidney. So with aggressive hydration, nutritional detox, it improved his cardiac function, improved his cardiac output, uh, it allows us to reduce his medications. We also uh, analyzed his functional uh, test. Now, on day one, we had him walk on the treadmill, uh, and he only went for one minute. Now, the blue denotes the Bruce protocol. That's a more aggressive uh, treadmill protocol. The green is a modified Bruce protocol. It's a slower incline, a slower uh, increase. So uh, the very first day we had him for a minute, he was able to do uh, two weeks after, able to do four minutes on a modified Bruce, and then that went up to, to six minutes. Uh, and June 9th, his, his um, 
uh, Bruce protocol time went up to over three times, so three minutes from one minute, four seconds, and his modified Bruce went about three times. So roughly he had a threefold increase uh, in his functional status uh, from baseline to the end in terms of his overall ability. And much of what we did is did a nutritional detox, hydrate him uh, aggressively uh, and the like. Um, his pre and post stress uh, numbers, I'm not gonna uh, bore you with the details of this, but uh, his resting heart rate in the 90s and post stress heart rate only 106. The, the closer these two are, it shows uh, the worst is hemodynamic performance is. And we noticed that the difference between those two pre and post stress heart rates uh, increase and that show uh, consistent with better physiological uh, condition. I show this graph just to show you that the weight was all over the place. You can't just use weight gain, weight loss in every situation in individuals who are acutely ill because the weight's gonna change for lots of reasons. The volume status and various other things will happen uh, in the acute setting. And so weight will bounce around even in someone with congestive heart failure. Uh, systolic and diastolic blood pressure similarly bounce around because there are many things happening in the acute condition of the patient, uh, as well as the heart rate, which again, bounce around because the patient's clinical condition is changing due to the acute uh, nature of it. The last case, case four, is about as acute as it gets. I'm going to go through the scenario with you and share what happens with this patient here. So um, this is a patient, a middle-aged man with no heart failure, presented for a follow-up office visit uh, uh, to see us. So uh, while sitting in the waiting room, uh, he slumped over. Uh, and so it was witnessed by one of our medical assistants and the front office staff. And I think the medical system was going to either call him back or another patient back. And he saw that he slumped over in the cha chair. Uh, they notify me and my clinical team, my nurse practitioners, and we all rush into the waiting area. And um, the patient's uh, our assessment, he's unresponsive and not breathing. So we immediately start off with CPR. Uh, I got in place, I tilted his head back and, you know, started, you know, directing my staff, uh, had one of the nurse practitioners start chest compression, I had my uh, clinical techs bring the AED back and, and other equipment, uh, IVs and, and the like, we moved all that, the uh, our waiting room became a, 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 a ICU center, I had another person, a receptionist, control the crowd, move people back, we started chest compressions, ambu bag respirations, and he got a single shot AED uh, and uh, we noticed spontaneous breathing recovered. Uh, we started an uh, IV, uh, he, you know, the pulse recovered and the like. And uh, the patient, uh, uh, you know, came to. Now we called the EMS during these resuscitative efforts and uh, he fully recovered by the time the EMS arrived. So again, he gets transported to the hospital uh, right up about four miles north of us in the medical center. Uh, he's evaluated in the emergency room. At that time, he's alert and responsive, uh, found to be hemodynamically stable. Uh, he remembers feeling dizzy uh, as he reports to the ER doctors and uh, remembers waking up and having people standing around him. Uh, cardiac troponins are done in the emergency room and they're found to be normal. So he's admitted on my service. Um, uh, the echo show the ejection fraction less than 20%. Uh, uh, cardiac catheterization was done. He had a totally occluded... Um, uh, right coronary artery, the left may had about a 40% lesion distally. The LED uh, was diffusely diseased with about 40 to 50% uh, disease in the middle. And the circumflex, the other major branch off the left, had uh, was diffusely diseased and had two small branches. Uh, we call them obtuse marginal branches coming off. Uh, and so what did we do to him treatment-wise? Well, of course, he was put on a nutritional detox, food level 0 to 4B, um, we decided not to revascularize them. My uh, interventional colleagues felt that there were, of course, there was no acute infarct. Uh, the vessels were, uh, and we did, you know, functional assessments of the vessels. Uh, they weren't amenable to uh, PCI and the targets weren't thought to be good for bypass. So we underwent an ICD implant uh, due to the fact that he had primary cardiac arrest, in our opinion. Uh, and um, he uh, eventually was discharged in good condition. Uh, continued to the nutritional detox and the standard treatment uh, and had close follow-up in our cardiac clinic. So what I want to share with you in this example is how, you know, an aggressive nutritional uh, detox uh, is integrated with uh, an aggressive acute care management. So when this patient arrests, it's not a matter of saying, okay, well now which, 
you know, herb do I treat him with? It's a matter of let's resuscitate the pressure patient and let's bring him into the hospital. That's one. The other major point I want to emphasize is that during the course of this acute management, this patient benefit from a nutritional detox. Now it may not be seen, may not seem obvious, but from the data I presented before, we see that these inflammatory markers and these uh, cardiac stress markers are reduced in a very rapid uh, time period, days to weeks. Uh, and I would even argue hours to days to weeks. Uh, and so this patient is receiving the benefit even during this hospital course of a nutritional intervention. Uh, and, um, uh, he invented, and, and this is what I like to, to, to think of as an ultimate integrative uh, approach. Mm -hmm.